Dr. Cha, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, distinguished ambassadors, lots of old friends. Uh, Kim Del Chung, I think the uh, the dean of the Fletcher graduates here in in the Republic of Korea. Park Soo Gil, a longtime friend who was serving uh, in the diplomatic corps in New York City when I was connected to uh, Cato and uh, was one of my mentors in teaching me a little bit at least about uh, this very complicated country and this very complicated part of the world. As Dr. Cha noted, I have long history here. I've been working here on and off over 20 years. I started when I was uh, persuaded somewhat against my better judgment to organize and direct the Korean Energy Development Organization, which was the outgrowth of our first effort, the U.S. and South Korea, to deal with the nuclear problems of North Korea. Uh, Cato, as it was known, was established, as many of you know, to implement the agreed framework of October 1994. Uh, we were charged with the small task of negotiating with the North Koreans for the construction of two 1,000 megawatt light water reactors in North Korea. And the thought was that these would replace, uh, in all senses, the nuclear program that the North Koreans had launched some years earlier and which we were all convinced was in fact a nuclear weapons program, not a power program. But in the agreed framework, we agreed to swap, in effect, light water reactors for their nuclear program. Uh, I did that for three years and then uh, moved here to Korea uh, at the invitation of uh, President Clinton to come back into the U.S. government. When I was running Cato, I, in fact, was working for, among others, the government of South Korea and the government of Japan and the government of the United States. So I'm probably the only American ambassador who can claim at one point to have been an employee of the Republic of Korea. And it was a position that was never easy and always challenging, but always very educational. Uh, I then spent three years here as ambassador in Seoul. I think for both my wife, Christine, and myself, those were among the best years we've ever had. Uh, very challenging, very demanding, but extremely satisfying and always educational. And we have very many fond memories of, uh, of our time here. It wasn't easy for me to persuade Chris that she had to come back to the U.S. with me. I think given the option, she would have decided to stay here in Korea. Uh, I then went to the Fletcher School where I was resting peacefully and doing my work when uh, I was asked to come back on a part-time basis into the administration in Washington and be the special representative for North Korea policy. Uh, I expected to do that for one year. That was my original understanding with Secretary Hillary Clinton. I ended up doing it for two and a half years. Uh, and it was interesting. I was pleased to have had the opportunity. Public service, I think, is a privilege and not a right. Uh, so I was very happy to have done it I must say, I did not come away with the same feeling of satisfaction that I did from my time here in South Korea as ambassador. It's a very frustrating problem and a very complex and difficult problem. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about the, the U.S. ROK relationship, and I'm going to talk a little bit about where we stand on our efforts to meet the challenges posed by North Korea, and then I'm going to speculate a bit on the directions in which we might choose to go uh, over the next few years. I would stipulate, uh, for the benefit of the press and everywhere else, uh, I am not in any way speaking on behalf of the United States government. Uh, these are my own reflections and very much my own opinions, and I take responsibility for them. I'm not trying to lay them off on anyone else. And I don't intend to be all that controversial, although some of what I say may not go down all that well in some parts of the world. Uh, as I look back on uh, our, 
our, our time here in Korea and the time that I've been working on directly or indirectly on the North Korean nuclear issue, I am struck on the one hand by how much is the same, how much has not changed. Uh, the, uh, and then, by, on the other hand, by how much has changed. Uh, looking here at South Korea, for example, uh, the South Korea of 2012 resembles in not very many ways the South Korea of 1992 when I started working on this, and certainly even not the South Korea of 2000 when we left here. This is a more developed country. It's a more self-confident country. It's more sophisticated in all ways. Its economic and political, political success have made the Republic of Korea a role model for aspiring and developing economies and de democracies around the world. And it is something for which South Korean people deserve full, res full credit and uh, should receive great accolades for what they have done in this country over slightly more than one generation. Uh, the relationship itself between the United States and South Korea, uh, I can testify, has never been simple. It is a relationship that is full of historical complexities. Uh, it has been a relationship in flux for over 60 years. It started, of course, in the blood of war and has held together very effectively over the decades since the end of the Korean War. And I think it is a relationship of which we can both be proud. Not that we have not each made our own errors and our own mistakes, but by and large it's a relationship that has worked. It is a relationship that demands constant attention. Uh, this is not a bilateral relationship that, as we would say, can be put on cruise control. It requires very active management from the very top of our respective administrations. And it gives, I think, particularly for ambassadors, uh, a swath of responsibility that is very challenging, but is, on the other hand, as I said earlier, uh, very, very uh, satisfying. Korea itself, while it has developed greatly, it also continues to face some problems. As I look ahead another generation, it strikes me that the problem that Korea faces that is most uh, difficult to sort of get your uh, seize in a, in a intellectually is the, pro the problems posed by what is, in effect, the most rapidly aging society within the OECD. Uh, the implications of that are, are profound. The implications of it for how you save money how you use those savings, how you allocate government programs, uh, left to its own evolution, for example, that profound demographic shift would result in a massive increase in the ratio between Korean public debt and the Korean gross national product. And that, I think, is something that is only now beginning to be comprehended by analysts and by policymakers, and more importantly, by the public itself. Uh, here in the region, of course, we see the prospect of very substantial leadership changes, as Dr. Cha mentioned, uh, one that has already taken place in North Korea. Uh, that was not actually a voluntary leadership change, but it nonetheless took place. Here in South Korea and in the United States, we look forward to having newly elected governments uh, in the course of this year. Here in, in the Republic of Korea, it will be a new government. In the United States, it's still uncertain as to whether it will be a new government or a re-elected Obama administration. I leave it to everyone to express their personal preferences on that question. Uh, we are seeing also, as Dr. Cha mentioned, a massive change of leadership in China, one that happens every 10 years. And while I am personally very confident it will proceed smoothly, I think it's, it's noteworthy that it has not proceeded thus far quite as smoothly as one might perhaps have expected. There might be a change of leadership in, in, in Japan, as was pointed out. 
Uh, the U.S., for its part, is, I think, coming off a bad decade. We ended up fighting two wars, still fighting one, trying to withdraw from it. And we ended up experiencing the most severe economic downturn or economic recession of the, nearly the past century. Uh, that has had a profound effect on U.S. polity and our society and a profound effect on the way in which many Americans view the rest of the world. I don't personally detect any shrinkage of American uh, willingness to provide leadership in the world, but clearly the context within which we're, we will provide that leadership is very different. We are going to look for solutions to problems much more so now than in the past, which are in essence multilateral solutions. I think there is a, a lack of appetite in the United States to take on principal responsibility for global problems, for global security problems, for the management of the global economy. And we will continue to look to countries such as, for example, the Republic of Korea to take on a growing share of responsibility for leadership in meeting these, these uh, problems. Coming back to uh, the bilateral relationship, the one thing that has not changed is, I think, in, the, in that relationship, the core issue remains that the same as it has been for the 60 years since the end of the Korean War. How do the two of us, working closely together, deal with the North, North Korean security threat to the South and the challenge that it poses to regional stability overall. Now, over the last 60 years, a lot has changed. S Northeast Asia, for one thing, has now become what some would argue the, the center of the global economy. Severe disruption of stability in Northeast Asia would have profound consequences, not just for this region, but indeed for the global economy. From 1953 until now, the U.S. and the Republic of Korea have relied principally on deterrence as a means of blunting the North Korean security threat and preserving security here in South Korea and stability in the region. That has worked, and we should not be bashful about pointing out that it has worked. We have not had any significant military conflict over that period. And uh, it has provided a shield behind which the Republic of Korea and the people of Korea have been able to carry out this dramatic, unprecedented development, not only of your economy, but also of your political system. Uh, it must be said, however, that in recent years, beginning in the early 1990s, the capability or the effectiveness of deterrence has been complicated by the emergence of the North Korean nuclear threat. And in many ways over the past 20 years, at least the past 18 years, the principal issue examined by our relationship and by the countries around uh, the Korean Peninsula has been how do we counter this new threat to uh, security, the threat that emerges from North Korea's efforts to develop nuclear weapons and to develop ballistic missiles, because the two must be viewed as two parts of a, the same threat. We have tried various things. We have tried, first of all, deterrence, and deterrence, as I said, has worked. We've tried to supplement deterrence with various kinds of engagement or diplomacy. Uh, we started in 1994 when the U.S. negotiated the agreed framework with North Korea, but uh, it was not that South Korea was not involved. South Korea was very much involved, although because of the arrangements of that day, South Korea was not directly involved by sitting at the table. That has changed over the years, and South Korea now is very directly involved. In any case, the agreed framework actually worked for about eight years. There, so the North Koreans did not produce, at that time, any more fissile material 
from their plutonium program uh, for, for eight years. Had that program continued unabated, it's, I think, can be argued that North Korea would now have sufficient fissile material for from uh, 20 to 40 nuclear devices in place of the, what we now think was pro is probably three to six nuclear devices. So it very much held down uh, the potential for uh, nuclear growth within North Korea. Uh, unfortunately, the agreed framework fell apart in the early 2000s, in 2002. And North Korea broke out of its commitments uh, to freeze its plutonium production. And the United States discovered, as we confirmed in later years, that North Korea was hedging against a failure of the overall agreement by embarking upon a program to produce enriched uranium, which, as you all know, is an alternative to plutonium as a fissile material for the production of nuclear weapons. It was confirmed in 2010 by physical observation by an American scientist that, in fact, North Korea had advanced quite far in establishing the infrastructure necessary for uranium enrichment. How much they may have actually enriched uh, through that program is unknown, and I think one of our first goals should be to try to find out more about that program. In any event, uh, the six-party process, or the agreed framework, rather, fell away, and for two or three years, uh, there was nothing in place to constrain the North Koreans. Finally, as the six-party process was established, with leadership particularly from China. Uh, it began a process of negotiation, which up through 2007 and into 2008 looked to be making progress. There was a well often quoted joint statement which committed all six countries in the region, including the United States, to four major goals, including first of all denuclearization, but also uh, replacement of the armistice with a peace arrangement and economic and energy assistance to North Korea and diplomatic relations among all countries in the region. Uh, we uh, proceeded down that path until 2009, and I hope there was no uh, relationship between my re-entry into the problems of North Korea and the very visible problems we began having to keeping the, the, uh, the six-party process alive. Because in truth, we have not now seen a meeting of the six-party process uh, since 2008. And that was a meeting which did not produce very much. So over the last four years, what we've been trying to do is to bring about a set of conditions that would permit the reconvening of the six-party process. And what I would like to talk about today is to raise some questions about where we go next. I am assuming that after our elections are over, we have newly elected governments in place here in South Korea and in the United States, that attention will turn again to the question of how we deal with North Korea. What should our basic strategy be? Right at the outset, I would confess that my preference remains very strongly a policy of engagement, supplementing a continuation of our policy of deterrence. But I recognize that on the basis of recent experience, in fact, on the basis of experience over the last 20 years, uh, not everyone will agree that engagement is the way we should go. And everyone actively seeks an alternative to engagement with North Korea both because the results of engagement have so far not been very spectacular, and also because seeking engagement and implementing engagement with North Korea is very, very difficult. On the other hand, you have to look at what options are available, and option, the options are all bad. And on the one hand, we could continue to rely primarily on deterrence as our strategy. It's worked. I confess that I think it's worked well, but 
as North Korea proceeds with its nuclear program, I think there is more and more reason to question whether uh, deterrence is an adequate strategy. It has to be part of what we're doing, but le left to their own devices, I think there's no question that North Korea is committed to continuing to develop both its nuclear program and its missile program. Moreover, I very strongly believe on the basis of my own contacts over the years with the North Koreans that they don't want to be ignored. They need engagement. They need engagement, of course, on their terms, but they will not be ignored. And they have ways, not all of them very pleasant, of attracting our attention and forcing us to engage with them. Others would argue that this is not just the U.S. and South Korea's problem. Why don't we just leave it to China? After all, the Chinese are the major source of external assistance for the North Koreans, and it's, it's reasonable to argue that China, which also does not want to see North Korea become a nuclear weapon state on a permanent basis, that if China really wanted to, they could stop the North Korean nuclear program. They could use the leverage of their own economic and energy assistance to tell the North Koreans to turn it off. Well, the only problem with that is that I don't think it will work. I don't think it will work uh, because, first of all, I think for the Chinese, while they don't want to see North Korea develop a permanent nuclear weapons capability, they are also very reluctant to push North Korea too hard in fear, out of fear that it could force North Korea to collapse or cause North Korea to collapse. And for the Chinese, collapse in North Korea and the alternatives which might then exist are at least as unpleasant and perhaps more so than the current course of North Korea becoming a nuclear weapon state. Moreover, on the basis of my own conversations with Chinese and North Koreans, I'm not at all confident that no matter what the Chinese did, that the North Koreans would respond positively. Um, North Korea, along with Koreans in general, have a history of several thousand years of resisting Chinese pressure. And I think that the North Koreans have established that they, for various reasons, none of them pleasant, but for various reasons, they can contain their domestic political situation regardless of the pressures that are imposed upon them from, a, from the outside. Uh, public welfare is not a major consideration in the formulation of North Korean foreign policy. So I don't think that we can ignore them. I don't think that China will solve the problem for us. And other, I don't have great confidence that simply waiting for North Korea to collapse is a viable policy option. We've been, in effect, waiting for North Korea to collapse for the last quarter century. And the last time I checked, they're still there. And I see no evidence that they're about to disappear. Now, they are going through their own leadership transition. It is striking to me how little we actually know about the internal dy dynamics of that. But this is a dynastic regime. It's now in its third generation. I think that there are a sufficient number of people in Pyongyang and elsewhere who s believe that their own future and well-being is closely associated with the survival of this regime. So I, I'm not, I mean, if, if it were to collapse, I would not lament that, but I do not anticipate that it's going to happen as a way of bailing us out of our policy dilemma. And I would note that I'm not sure that here in South Korea there is much appetite for the collapse of North Korea. The social and economic implications of a collapsed North Korea here in the Republic of Korea could indeed be very profound. So I come back to the need sometime next year, I would think in the first half of next year, for South Korean officials and American officials representing the governments that are then in power, sitting down and trying to thrash out what we do next. Where are we going? 
My own assumption is that they will conclude that some form of engagement, perhaps more tightly tied to reciprocity than it has been in the past, uh, certainly in terms of s the things that South Korea would have to receive in order to resume a significant program of foreign assistance to North Korea, but some form of that is likely to emerge as a stated policy. That leaves <clears throat> one major question to be answered. And that is engagement, yes, but engagement to what end? What are we seeking? Just to stabilize North Korea, to stabilize the, the peninsula? Or do we still have a long-term goal, a long-term vision of the condition that we want to bring about? For the last several years, our approach to nor the North Korean nuclear issue has been based on something that has acquired its own acronym, CVID, Comprehensive, Verifiable, Irreversible Denuclearization. That is a goal that has been set out by, in countless policy statements by all of the five governments associated with the uh, the six-party talks by now three different administrations in Washington and a number of administrations here in the Republic of Korea. I'm all for it. I think it's a great goal. I do not, however, believe that in the foreseeable future it is achievable. Uh, the comprehensive part might be achievable. Uh, the irreversible part is not, not achievable, as we've learned from watching what happened in North Korea after uh, 2009 when they showed that they could again be, or after 2002. And more importantly, and most significantly, significantly of all, the verification part of CVID, I think, is gone. I do not understand how, if we believe that, as I think we do, that North Korea has the reality or the potential, if not the reality, to produce fissile material from uranium enrichment. And that regime continues to exist in its present form in which it is very opaque, uh, no transparency. How we could give any credibility to commitments that North Korea might make that the that there will be adequate verification of freeze or a nuclear stop or a nuclear dismantlement. It was, it was feasible when we were looking primarily at a plutonium program. We can tell pretty well through our various mech, uh, technical means whether North Korea is producing plutonium. We can't tell very well whether or not they're producing enriched uranium. Uh, we know that they have the potential to do that, we think, because they actually showed us an enrichment facility at Yongbyon. I assume that if they showed us that one, it means they've got others. And if you talk to people about uranium enrichment, it, it's not quite something that you can do in your home basement, but it's something that can be easily hidden from the outside world. So I don't see how we could negotiate an agreement in which we claim that we've got verification, adequate verification, and really have it. So I think that is a major flaw in our current approach towards CVID. But that does not mean that we, I think, can afford just to abandon the ultimate goal of denuclearization. Uh, I think we have to continue to hold that out as our long-term goal. And then we have to be prepared to be patient enough and committed enough to work toward that goal in a very systematic fashion. Uh, I think what could be achievable is a negotiated standstill agreement in the first instance. A standstill agreement which aimed at, as Dr. Sig Harrison, who was the one to whom they showed their uranium enrichment program, he's long advocated a policy of no more nukes and no better nukes. We know whether or not they're testing. And a commitment by them not to test would, in fact, be meaningful. 
because it would mean that they're no longer technologically perfecting their nuclear program. Uh, no, no, no better nukes would mean, in effect, no new nukes. We could try to extract a commitment that they will not produce any more fissile material. I think with plutonium, that's easy, as I suggested with uranium enrichment. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible. We would have to, I think, to supplement that commitment to a standstill and eventual long-term denuclearization with much more visible progress than our governments have thus far been able to make toward some of the other goals of the September 2005 joint statement, including, importantly, concrete steps toward the replacement of the armistice with a comprehensive peace regime. Having been involved in this to some extent, I have no illusions about how difficult and complex that will be. But I think if we break the problem down into pieces, we can perhaps begin to make some progress. I think also that our longer term, term goal should be to create within Northeast Asia a network or a web, if you will, of undertakings and benefits that North Korea would receive from in the area of energy, in the area of economic development, in the area of trade, that would begin to constitute a series of restraints or constraints on their actions. In other words, only by giving North Korea a vested interest in the stability of the region do I think that we have the possibility of gradually reducing and eventually perhaps even under optimal circumstances uh, ending uh, their nuclear program and the nuclear threat. So let me stop there. Uh, I think I've spoken just about as long as I was supposed to and no longer, but I would be very happy to entertain any questions or comments that any of you might have. I would stress again these are my own observations. This is not a formal proposal. This is a series of conclusions that I've drawn from roughly 20 years of exposure here. I think it is a particular challenge dealing with this problem, it is a particular challenge for our two democracies. And because we have to be transparent and we have to be candid with our own populations. And I don't believe that we can say, one, that there's no problem, we don't need to be concerned about it, we'll simply rely on deterrence. North Korea has already demonstrated that it's prepared to do things and has tried to do things around the corner from deterrence, providing uh, nuclear programs to countries in the Middle East, for example. I don't think, similarly, that we can say to ourselves, well, we're just going to give it up. We'll enhance our forces, will enhance deterrence, I think at some point something is going to go badly wrong. So I think we have no choice but to re-engage with ourselves and be candid with our publics because we cannot, we're not going to be able to fool them. They're going to know through the marvels of modern media uh, whether what we say is happening is happening or not. Uh, but I think that we have the possibility with very careful diplomacy and patience and a willingness not simply to give to the North Koreans, but to hold them to strict standards. And I think that can be done. So uh, let me stop. <laughs>